Hi, everyone. Welcome to our final panel. My name is Dr. Aaron Rowe, and I'm the Vice Dean for Undergraduate Education here at the Krieger School for Arts and Sciences at Johns Hopkins. I'm also an Associate Professor in the Department of History. For the next portion of our afternoon, this last panel, I will be in conversation with Dr. Martha Jones. Dr. Jones is the Hard Histories Project Director at Johns Hopkins University. She's the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and Professor at the NSF Agora Institute. Martha's work centers on the legal and cultural history of Black Americans in the United States and how they have shaped American democracy. Welcome, welcome, Martha, Dr. To, the, to our conversation. Thanks for having me. So just to start, um, I was having trouble uh, hearing you for a second there. Um, so I, I would love to start off by hearing more about the Hard Histories project that, that you direct, how it came into being and, and what, your, what your role is in it at the present time. Sure. Um, well, thanks very much, um, Dr. Rowe, for um, being part of this conversation with me. Um, and I want to thank uh, Dean Chalenza, um, Allison Seiler at Hopkins Retrospective, um, and everybody for what has been a really um, extraordinary, um, challenging, and important afternoon. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here to talk some about the work we're doing at the Hard Histories Lab. You know, on the one hand, this lab was um, born out of the uh, 2020, late 2020 revelations. Um, new facets of Mr. Hopkins's life were coming into view, um, and we needed a, a structure and a long-term way to explore um, the questions that his life um, were, were beginning was beginning to raise, but more broadly. Um, it was an opportunity to um, create a structure that would think deliberately and long-term about the history of race and racism at Johns Hopkins. Um, and that is um, the central nugget of our charge. But it's no coincidence that this happens at the end of 2020 um, after a, a summer of national uprisings um, in many ways, um, inspired um, by the tragic killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And so the lab is also really very much indebted to activists and community members across the country and really across the world um, who, um, in a sense, inspire and insist upon the kind of work that we do. Um, I'll also say that I think that this is a moment for a kind of a special or distinct kind of reckoning in Baltimore itself. Um, it turns out that while we at Johns Hopkins were initiating the Hard Histories Project, um, institutions like the Walters Art Museum and the Maryland Center for History and Culture um, were also beginning to look at their origins in that um, very complicated mid 19th century moment in which Baltimore is roiling um, with slavery, um, with emancipation, um, with the rise of segregation and more. Um, so it turns out that we are part of a reckoning that's happening at Goucher College, it's happening at Morgan State, it's happening at Clifton Mansion. Um, and so we are really part of a much broader um, reckoning, I think, finally in this city with how to understand um, that history. Um, my role is to, um, among other things, um, lead um, undergraduate researchers and graduate student researchers um, in an exploration of, um, yes, the history of Mr. Hopkins, but more generally the history of race and racism um, at Johns Hopkins. Um, we do that um, through archival research, and I know we'll get to talk more about that. Um, we also do that through um, engagement with the historiography or the literature of history. Um, we are the host to um, about a half dozen public events each semester where we invite experts um, from 
classic works like Jessica Millward's work on Charity's Folk to um, cutting edge work. Um, we just had Dr. Ana Rosado from Northwestern who's just finished a dissertation on slavery and emancipation in Southern Maryland. Um, so creating a space for um, us as an institution, as a university community, but for broader communities of interest to come together around um, cutting edge scholarship. And then the last piece is we are part of a, a community, as you've heard in some of the early panels, um, of other universities and colleges that are engaged in this work. So um, the silver lining of um, the Zoom uh, era has been that we have had a chance to visit um, with colleagues at Rice University and USC and Morgan State and elsewhere um, to talk back and forth with them about the ways in which they're approaching their questions um, and um, what they are um, in fact finding. Um, you know, I would say just to sum up um, our, uh, the way I see our work, um, that we are really here to um, forthrightly look at the kinds of founding stories, um, the myths, the half and partial truths um, that undergird our institution as they undergird gird many, many American institutions um, and to bring um, the lens and the light of historical research to those questions. Um, as um, other folks have already said, um, perhaps Dr. Rothman most directly, um, to um, really um, pave a way, right? To at least the possibility of a different kind of future and a most just future. Um, and so we hope um, that um, we do history for history's sake, because we, we, we love that work, um, but we also do it to be part, to contribute to a much um, broader reckoning that's happening many, in many, many corners of the institution. That leads me to, to but my follow-up question really is about that it is about that engagement that you were just talking about, particularly with Morgan State, but you also mentioned a few a few other institutions in the Baltimore area, like the Walters and Goucher. So I guess I have two questions for you. One is the extent to which hard histories is engaging like directly with other movements that are that are happening inside the Baltimore area. So it, it is there is there a a community in a, in a more substantial sense, or is it, you know, everybody is kind of taking their reckoning or their history in their own way and, and you know, sharing with each other, but not necessarily, you know, um, it's tied together, I guess. And the, well, let, let me just ask that question, then I can ask the other one that came at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, this work has been an opportunity for us to build new sorts of bridges between mm -hmm. um, particularly Baltimore institutions. So um, I have been um, behind the scenes, if you will, um, at the Walters Museum as they have reckoned not only with the history of slaveholding in some of their um, sites, but also um, the, the politics of Mr. Walters himself and his particularly his alliance um, and affinities for the Confederacy during the Civil War. Um, over at Maryland um, History and Culture, um, they not so long ago had a, an exhibit on the Civil War that didn't address enslavement at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there was an opportunity for historians to come in and to um, help them rethink that very important installation, which is a place where many, many school children in Baltimore learn some version of the Civil War um, to, um, to uh, rethink that exhibit and, and um, transform it into one that um, centers enslavement um, as importantly as it should be. Um, so we're, I think, um, in the process of forging kind of new relationships, and especially for those of us who come from institutions that were founded in the mid 19th century um, and did in their own ways um, turn away from, cover up, um, misrepresent, and maybe mis even misunderstand um, our origins, um, the Maryland history and culture founded by the American Colonization Society, the Walters that 
bears the family name of this um, interesting figure um, and us with Mr. Hopkins. Um, so I hope that we are part of um, a, a moment of reckoning for the city as a whole and that um, this is just the beginning of it. I, because we're talking about the lab, I'll say that just two weeks ago, um, the lab um, together we visited Clifton Mansion, um, which was Mr. Hopkins's um, home, um, the place where he held um, four enslaved people as reported on the 1850 census. Um, and it was extremely instructive for us to see that place, to understand the landscape and the architecture and more. Um, but it was really an important opportunity for us then to share what we're learning with the staff there who are uh, challenged now to reinterpret that place in light of new, um, new histories. Um, mm -hmm. So we are really, um, I think, all part of the same project, but you're right that we're at the beginning of building those um, connections. And, you know, speaking of being at the beginning of building connections, because, you know, it was such a recent, um, such a, you know, as you've said, the chronology of hard histories is so relatively recent and was born out of that very specific moment in 2020. And so I'm wondering how, how you or, and or the, the other participants in hard histories imagine the evolving relationship with communities inside Baltimore, not just institutions, but communities. And, it, you know, how much that, like, that has been a part of how you conceptualize your project. Yeah, um, I guess the way I would um, think about it, um, and I'm gonna bracket out the COVID conditions, mm -hmm. which, which is right. ever present in all yeah. our work. Um, from whether, you know, can you actually access the archives to then where do you go and who do you see and how do you work with community. Mm -hmm. um, that I've been trying to think about it as um, concentric circles. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so one version of that circle are these um, institutional um, uh, allies who are working on similar questions. Um, and there's a circle that's sort of a national one of universities and then this mm -hmm. local one. Um, at the same time, um, uh, I've been very interested in thinking, somebody earlier today mentioned the one Hopkins concept. Um, we've been really committed to um, working in a way that permits and invites everyone from Johns Hopkins, not only our campus, the Homewood campus, which is the arts and sciences campus, and perhaps the campus that might most evidently be um, concerned and engaged with historical research. Well, it turns out all our campuses are deeply interested. And yes, our faculty, yes, our students, but also importantly, our staff. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the ways we measure um, the success of our public events, which are on Zoom or hybrid, um, is that we have folks who come from all our campuses um, and from many different facets of the workings of the university to those events. Um, they are now beginning to attract um, Baltimoreans more broadly. We had Dr. Cami Fletcher with us a few weeks ago. Dr. Fletcher works on the history of Mount Auburn Cemetery, which was um, the first independent um, African-American cemetery. And she brought out the community of um, genealogists, um, mm -hmm. of um, members of faith communities and more. And that was really exciting for us because it was uh, an, a manifestation of the ways in which we can continue to build, um, build those circles. Um, so um, we will continue to work in that way. I think even after we go back to um, what we hope will be more ordinary conditions, um, I think our events will always be hybrid so that anybody could take a lunch break and be with us and learn from this extraordinary community of um, expert historians who are um, in the archives and really showing us new facets of the history of Baltimore and Maryland. So you mentioned at the, at the in your opening remarks that uh, that undergraduate research had 
had been a part of hard histories from the very beginning, or that that was an area that you were involved with. So I guess I'm wondering if it had been part of from the very beginning, if it was baked into the design of what hard histories was meant to be and meant to accomplish, and you know why you decided that 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 should be at the part of the center of that, and and then you know how how that impulse was part of your 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 larger or previous pedagogical commitments, teaching commitments, and the way you were you were working with your students? Sure. We looked at a lot of models and we had the benefit, of course, by 2020 of the nearly 70 institutions that were already associated with the University Studying Slavery Project, which is uh, has its home at UVA. Um, so we really had um, no shortage of models. Um, there are um, important scholarly writings on how institutions have approached this subject. We benefited from the wisdom of people like Dr. Leslie Harris, um, who was for a long time at Emory and now at Northwestern, um, and others like that who have been in the trenches of this work since 15 years ago, really, when Dr. Ruth Simmons, um, we must remember, um, courageously um, and in the face of um, important opposition, um, when she, as an incoming president at Brown, understood there were reasons right, to inquire about the mm. connections between Brown and the slave trade and slave holding, it was, uh, it was Ruth Simmons who stepped in and opened the way for so many of us. So we had a lot uh, to, to um, look at, to borrow from. Um, and my sense um, was that um, an investment in student researchers was one of the most um, powerful gifts we could give to the institution. Because mm -hmm. um, while we, many of us experience students as um, transient, um, they, we see them for a semester, we might see them for a year, four years, they move on. Um, in fact, Students become alums and they become benefactors. They become trustees. Um, they become the stewards of this institution. Um, and early in our work, I had the opportunity to meet with our trustees and to meet with those folks who had made that journey from student to trustee. Um, and my belief is that for the long-term value of this work, um, to put it in the hands of students and to, um, early on um, firm up their investment, um, not only in, as so many people have said, as Dr. Turner said, right, not only in the part of the institution that makes you feel good um, and that, you know, you can laud, um, but also about the, the hard work of what it is to um, shepherd an institution across centuries into a 21st century. Um, that is the best investment I thought we could make is in our is in our students. And they will be here, frankly, um, when I am not. Um, and I'll also say, if I could, you know, you were my director of undergraduate studies at that time. And part of it was that institutionally, we were ready to support this kind of student opportunity for research, for interpretation, for learning and more. Um, and so it wasn't difficult. Um, in the Krieger School to propose this and to have it actually um, happen. So, so thank you for that. So I, you know, that that leads me to a, have a follow up about that, which is, you know, going back to your idea about investment. And I'm wondering how you, as a teacher, see the relationship between. So sometimes we can think, and I think sometimes our students experience this way. Uh, you know, unfortunately, in a lot of cases. To university as is sometimes a, a passive experience, right? They they are presented with knowledge, and yes, they do things with that. Turn it into re, turn it, you know, write papers, give feedback in class. So there, there, so there's engagement there, but it is, it, it is, it, it's kind of very tightly sealed in a, a classroom and a very specific kind of agenda. Whereas the, the type of work that you do with your students in, in the hard histories lab is so much more 
you know, it's hands-on, it's open-ended, it, you know, in this, in the way that real research is, where you don't know where it's going to go, um, but you're excited by asking the questions. And so I'm wondering how you see, if you see that particular element, the, what the, the hands-on, the open element as being key to that investment that you were just talking about. Yeah, this is um, asking students to be um, the producers of knowledge. Um, that means um, to um, master in a, in a first, for many of them, a first time, but mm -hmm. important way, um, the theories and the methods of historical research, but also, as you've heard today, um, to uh, take up the, um, the political and the ethical um, aspects of this work. Um, our uh, graduate teaching assistant um, in the uh, last uh, spring, uh, Mallory Pilat um, built for us a, a unit that explored the ethical um, dimensions of this um, so that um, we appreciate that this isn't research in some abstracted or removed sense, right? But there, there are stakes both for the past and the present and what we do. Um, so this is, um, you're right, for some students challenging, but it's also why they come to the lab mm -hmm. um, because they hear the same, um, they hear the same important debates, they hear the noise, they hear the rancor, they hear the protest, um, they hear the pain, um, they live that, many of them. Um, and the lab is a place um, where um, they can take um, that which they know and which they experience in the world and um, discover a way of working with it, um, understanding it newly, um, but then also putting it in the world. Um, and, and you know that this is one of the questions that I've had as in some moments, this work has been very controversial um, and has, um, you know, um, nearly devolved in the public sphere, right, into um, ad hominem, um, that is not exactly the kind of place where you want to introduce young people who are doing research for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, so I say they were also very courageous um, mm -hmm. because um, they have also spent time studying the controversy um, and trying to understand that too, so that their voices um, are um, at least um, consonant um, with um, some of the most difficult conversations we're having about the work. I'm always struck by the, by how eager our students in the history department are to to be a partner in that kind of work that you were just talking about. How how deeply they want to understand the the city, the institution, but also the city that they live in. Even the ones that are not from Baltimore or the Mid Atlantic at all. They they have a they have this desire for engagement, which is very exciting and. And they, they constantly are gravitating, right, towards those questions. But they are also, um, I think, unsettled as mm. they um, settle in at the institution. Mm. Um, some of them are unsettled by um, the distance, right, that they um, feel they live with from yeah. Baltimore City. Um, and what we've discovered in the lab um, is that that isn't a new dilemma in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. We go back to the 1880s and this semester we're working on a project that begins with historian and librarian Herbert Baxter Adams and Adams's vision for um, university extension courses, um, taking Hopkins to the masses in Baltimore City. Well, we learn not all masses are the same in Adams's view. Um, and he's interested in European immigrants and bringing the university to them, but not to black Baltimoreans um, in those years. Um, but we also discover that he in the 1880s is wrestling with the question, what should be the relationship of this institution to the city of Baltimore? And we have answered that, I think um, in, uh, uh, complicated, troubled, incomplete, um, and, and, un and deeply unsettling ways over our entire history. Um, and our students know that they sit with that question also. And the lab is at least a new way to um, approach wrestling with that question. Mm -hmm. 
I would love it. That That's a great segue because I would love to hear you kind of walk through the a more kind of nuts and bolts of what what your students are doing in the lab, how they how the projects evolve, how you guide them through that process. You know, our, um, our remit um, was um, ambitious, um, but open ended, which is wonderful, really race and discrimination, racism at Johns Hopkins across our history. And so mm -hmm. our goal is to move from some of these early histories that have been the focus of the discussion today um, to where we are now, which is working in part on the um, on the early 20th century. Um, so, for example, um, I mentioned uh, our look at this semester at um, U University Extension and mm -hmm. um, how Hopkins sort of comes to Baltimore and ultimately comes to teacher education. Well, that was inspired by a, a small cache of letters in the W.E.B. Du Bois papers. We heard from Dr. Connolly today about Dr. Du Bois. Um, amid, amidst Du Bois's papers um, is an exchange with President Good. Good Good low, right? Good low, good now. Oh gosh. Okay, somebody will correct me on the Twitter. Um, <laughs> yes, already, uh, Allison. Good now. Thank you. Good now. <laughs> um, so um, there's an exchange between the two because Du Bois, in his role at the NAACP, has um, become aware of um, a university extension teacher education program in Wilmington, Delaware, that has excluded, run by Hopkins, and that has. Mm -hmm excluded black educators from the program. And Du Bois challenges the university. And the answer is um, something like, I'm paraphrasing, goes something like, we as an institution respect the laws of the state. And if the laws of the state demand segregation, we mm -hmm. defer. Um, well, we were inspired by that to understand the long history of how the university gets to that moment. Um, and so our students are in the papers of Dr. Du Bois, of the university leadership. Um, they are working with um, newspapers, um, the Baltimore Sun and the Baltimore Afro. Um, they are reading the papers of Herbert Baxter Adams, um, all to sort of fill in and shed light on this, um, on this um, provocative confrontation um, that happens in 1925. And so are the collections that you just mentioned that they've been looking at, are those, are, I mean, I, I imagine some of them or most of them are digitized. Are others collections that we hold in the Hopkins Special Collections? Do you, do you also go to other smaller archives and libraries throughout the city? Um, yes, is the answer. Um, uh, we, um, We've had some extraordinary institutional partners who have helped us work with primary materials despite public health um, restrictions. Um, so the Maryland State Archives, um, the Maryland Center for History and Culture, our own special collections library, um, everyone has really gone um, the distance to um, helping us to access materials, whether it is in person um, or by way of digital access. Um, and so, um, so we've been able to work um, and work around, if you will. Um, but part of my job is to make sure, of course, that students actually have archives um, to work with. Um, you know, so for example, um, early on, we worked with the US census trying to understand the 1840 and 1850 censuses better. Well, we could benefit from, for example, the University of Maryland collection of what in the 19th century were city directories, um, 19th century versions of the phone book. If anybody even remembers a phone book, I realize that's a dated reference too, um, but I think most folks will get the gist. Um, so they had a digitized collection that we could use um, and the university has access to the digitized um, census. And this was important for us because in order to understand the full meaning of these entries that if you will kind of inspire so much of we, what we've done in the last year, um, we had to look at the census as a whole. Um, we had to compare the census to the city directories. Um, and so um, that's the kind of work um, that we're able to do um, remotely. Um, and then um, we've had opportunities, for example, to um, 
speak to um, one of the theories that was offered up to us about Mr. Hopkins and um, enslaved people in his household. One of the theories was that he was, um, if you will, acquiring enslaved people to manumit them. Well, finally, we were able to get access to all of the surviving manumission records um, for Baltimore City and for Anne Arundel County um, and review those and um, answer the question, right? Do we find any evidence of Mr. Hopkins um, manumitting enslaved people? For us, the answer was no, we do not. But in order to do that, you've got to go through thousands of records um, and our students have done that work really um, diligently. I'm wondering, thinking about what you just said, and also back to the presentations by Drs. Johnson and Turner, how you walk your students or work with them through the complexity of, of an archive, what makes an archive, how we grapple with archives, archival silences, and, and other kinds of absence, right? Because sometimes even when you have material, something's not there, doesn't always mean that it wasn't there, if, if you follow what I mean. And so those are very complicated conceptual and methodological issues for, well, for all of us, but to walk undergrads through. And so I would love to hear about how you approach that in the lab. Yeah, it, it means in part um, that we're doing collectively what historians are always doing, which is, um, you know, short junctures in the work, we're pausing to say, now, what was my question? Um, what have I discovered? How do I need to shift my question now as I understand the archive better? I understand its possibilities and its strengths, but also its limitations. And so partly um, we work very deliberately to refine our questions, to shift our questions, and we're doing it collectively. Um, which is one of the benefits I think you and I don't always have, right? Which is in our work is that oftentimes we're sort of quite alone in our um, deliberations. Um, one of the advantages of a lab is that we all have the ability to come in and put things on the table to wrestle with them. And, and part of what has happened this semester in ways I never anticipated is that there are connections between the work um, and, and the topics that students are working on that we didn't even anticipate as we planned the research. So there's a delight right in the serendipity when um, things begin to line up. And I always tell students, I believe in that, right? When things begin to connect and click, you're, you're, you've, you've, you're figuring something out. Um, but there is also the, the lesson, which is um, you may spend many, many hours in materials and net nothing. And then um, we are left in a sense to grapple with what it means um, to uh, interpret a silence. Um, an example of this is um, um, around the relationship of Mr. Hopkins um, to um, the Quaker communities of Baltimore. Um, we know that he was um, dismissed um, from the Quakers um, for dealing in liquor with his brother. Um, uh, and we've searched a long time to discover whether he was ever rejoined or readmitted. Um, we found nothing. Um, and then we have to talk about how to interpret an absence, um, knowing that history is iterative, um, that history is, um, is unapologetically revisionist in the sense that we might exhaust an archive and arrive at a conclusion um, and, um, and then um, someone will bring a new cache of materials to us and we will have to consider those and revise perhaps our conclusions anew. Um, so it is true that um, there's a, so much contingency in what we do, particularly when we're working preliminarily. Um, and yet I can't help but think that this is the kind of you know, we often talk about critical thinking, right? This is a dimension of critical thinking, right? Is the ability to think and analyze in nuanced ways and contingent ways to come back and revise. Um, and I think that, um, or I hope at least, um, that that's a lesson that actually 
students can take to many kinds of research, not only to historical research, it turns out. Uh, it, it, before you arrived in, in Baltimore, I think it was more than a, could it have been a decade ago now, the Walters, the, the Walters had an exhibit called Revealing the Black Presence in Renaissance Europe. And one of the, one of the rooms had a, a, an empty frame and it and it had a label for Juan Latino, who is this very important um, Afro-Spanish university professor and poet. And we know he existed and there had been a portrait of him, but that was lost. And mm -hmm. so it, it was sort of forcing people to think about what it means when we don't we we know something, but don't know it or when the the evidence of something has has disappeared, whether deliberately or just through the ravages of time. And I found it a, a, a very provoking moment. And I think a lot of the, the people who saw the exhibition had a similar reaction, sometimes calling attention to the absence and having to sit and look at it can be as powerful as, as more literal forms of discovery. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, um, I know you know, but other folks might not, that I came to Johns Hopkins four years ago and or so um, after uh, a decade of uh, researching the early political history of Black Baltimore. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the other things I'm able to say to our students is that um, we won't find everything we'd wish to find. Um, but part of our charge is to um, find that which we can and to, and to make the most of it. Um, and so, in fact, while um, we certainly lament um, what we can't know, um, we can know a great deal about the world in which um, not only Mr. Hopkins lived and worked, but the enslaved people in his household lived and worked. Um, it's important to say Baltimore was not a slaveholding city mm -hmm. um, in those later years. This was a city vastly dominated by free African-Americans. Mm -hmm. Slaveholding was exceptional um, and it was um, as symbolic um, as it was exploitative because, and that is something we can know about the context um, of his world, even as we may not be able to speak um, directly to him. There's one more thing I, I want to uh, point to here. It's been alluded to today, but um, there is no surviving um, collection of Mr. Hopkins's papers. Mm -hmm. His business records, his personal correspondence and more um, are seemingly lost to us. Mm -hmm. um, there is speculation about everything from he destroyed them to they were destroyed in a fire. I've heard many stories, mm -hmm. um, but I've never seen any evidence of what might have happened to them. Um, and he is in this sense, unlike many of his peers um, who variously saved and deposited um, uh, their papers. Students are working this semester on the papers of the Kaiser and the Wyman family, um, whose um, gift to the university um, includes the land on which the Homewood campus sits today. Well, those papers were preserved and deposited at the university. Um, and so we're able to work differently and understand differently their stories. Um, in some sense, why Mr. Hopkins um, didn't choose to preserve his papers is perhaps a question we'll never be able to answer. Um, but his choice not to do so and not to arrange for that um, has left all of us, um, especially folks who are interested in the biographical matter of Mr. Hopkins, um, which is not exactly the charge of the lab, but for folks who are interested in the biography, um, I think this has been a period of um, some um, disappointment because he didn't, he, he didn't allow us to know um, the fuller story of who he was, how he thought, how he ran his household, how he ran his business and more. You know, you made an excellent point a, a moment ago about the sort of rich dynamic history of free black communities in Baltimore in the 19th century. And I'm wondering how 
in the in the lab, you and your students kind of, um, I guess, balance the the kind of the institutional, the the sort of white supremacist or racist institutional histories that that require right honest excavation and acknowledgement with you know kind of being side by side with also making sure that black baltimoreans are at the heart of their of their own history and that that is 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 the center right of of the project in a way that it has always been the center of your own research well um I think a, a good example of this um, comes from the work we did last semester on the figure of Dr. Kelly Miller. Um, and we heard Dr. Miller um, invoked, um, but he's known um, very cursorily at Johns Hopkins as having been the first um, African-American student at Johns Hopkins. He was a graduate mm -hmm. student in mathematics in the 1880s. Um, the story we tell about him um, is one of those partial, uh, almost mythical mm -hmm. stories. Um, Miller comes here, he studies mathematics for two years. He is, it has been said, unable to afford the tuition. Um, and he leaves uh, Johns Hopkins, returns to Washington, DC, um, and eventually will join the faculty at Howard University um, where it's important to say he goes on to be one of um, the early 20th century's uh, most important um, social scientists, mm -hmm. um, including a social scientist of race and racism. Um, well, we weren't quite satisfied with that story. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought we would center, not only to center Kelly Miller, but to dwell on Kelly Miller, mm -hmm. to sit with Kelly Miller, um, and to learn what we could about him. And it turns out we could learn a great deal about his years in Baltimore. Um, not only his experience at Johns Hopkins, which was um, not uninteresting in that um, his classmates included um, some of the great um, promoters of white supremacist thought at the end of the 19th century, um, Woodrow Wilson, and, and who I think needs no introduction, and, Thomas Dixon, um, the, the novelist whose, uh, whose work is behind the, the, um, the, the film Birth of a Nation. Um, so there's important things to know about the, um, the uh, context at Johns Hopkins. But I think as fascinating was that when we followed Kelly Miller into Baltimore, um, we learned not only where he lived, with whom he lived, we found him embedded in a community, um, a deeply active um, Black politics um, that was engaging in struggles over what? Over education and mm -hmm. over segregated education um, in Baltimore City, just at the moment that Miller um, is there and in this community and in this household of activists. And um, we accomplished that, right, by, is, I think you're suggesting, um, shifting our emphasis away from the institution and on to Dr. Miller himself. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out we were able to discover a great deal about him um, and to, if you will, fill out right, that biography, um, that cursory biography, um, to recognize the, the ways in which um, he was hardly alone um, and he was hardly um, uh, simply, if you will, a, a graduate student in mathematics, right? He was, um, he was part of things that were um, much more far ranging and things that were deeply consequential for Black Baltimoreans. Well, I, you know, I, it, you talking about that made me want to start asking you a million questions about something that, that is of great interest to me that I know you've done a lot of research on, which is, um, Mother Mary Lang and the Oakleight Sisters of Baltimore kind of sit with the the Black Catholic history of of this Catholic state. Um, but I I want to make sure that we have a chance to turn to our audience and give them the opportunity to ask questions, which we are uh, taking from the chat. And for this, I have to put on my my reading glasses. Um, and so um, one of the questions that one of the audience members has is 
how do you educate your students in terms of critically assessing and evaluating the political dimensions of the research? Sure. Um, I mentioned um, the unit that uh, Mallory Pilat prepared for us um, uh, last uh, spring. Um, and here we use case studies. Um, Dr. Johnson at the beginning of our afternoon um, pointed to the, um, the ongoing um, dispute with Harvard University over a collection of um, daguerreotypes um, taken of enslaved people um, now claimed by the descendants of those enslaved people um, against the university's claim to their property and their ownership over those images. We use that case um, as an example of um, how um, we want to be able to, um, yes, discern the artifacts, right, as historians and understand the artifacts, um, but we also want to understand how they came to be and how they came to be at Harvard. And the answer is, of course, they were commissioned by a member of the Harvard faculty. Um, but we also um, then want to engage with the family members, the descendants um, of the enslaved people themselves. We come, become a little bit legal historians. We read the judicial um, opinions right, that aim to use something as um, ill-fitting as property law to resolve these things. Um, and this is the fodder then for our discussion. So it's to say, um, Mallory was able to provide us with a series of case studies um, that had echoes um, in our own work, but weren't exactly the same, but permitted us to see um, that um, in the example of these photographs, there are, um, many vantage points, right? Many positions that come to the table um, and we have to think about those positions. We think about power um, we, and, and more um, in order to give us a kind of intelligence then for our own archives and our own critical understanding about who controls the archives that we use, um, who doesn't control them, what is there, what is not there. Um, and, um, and very importantly in the um, Harvard example um, is the family history, um, the family memory, um, that dimension of the story, which is not to be found in any archive, right? And is held, right, in, in, the, in the lives and the living archives of the descendants of enslaved people. So, um, uh, but in some, we use these case studies as a way to illuminate that. And because our work has been controversial or subject to controversy and subject to criticism, um, this semester we started with a look at that controversy, right? And, and tried to um, understand it best, the many sorts of interests that come to the table, our trustees, our alums, Baltimoreans, descendants uh, from many perspectives, as you've heard today, the Quaker community, um, the university, the faculty, students, right? And, um, and understanding that all of that is shaping um, not simply um, the, the, the buzz, right? It is shaping, it has shaped the archive, it has shaped the interpretation and, and much more. And so, you know, that makes me think of what you were you talking about it earlier about the students having these moments in in heart, the hard histories lab that can be really challenging, right? That they find challenging, and then they kind of have to sit with that. And I'm I'm wondering too, just building off this question. I shouldn't return to my own question, but it it, it maybe speaks to part of the question that was asked in a way. That do you have have there been moments and or uh, where students, are, are there um, disagreements or conflicts among students where it, because there are, it can be very a very painful subject that the instructors, you and the graduate students 
are you're figuring out how to navigate or how to help them navigate having these conversations that can be painful with each other. I guess that's what I'm trying to ask. Like, how do, how do we do that as teachers, help our students walk through how to engage with each other, these questions that are painful? Yeah, um, this semester, um, our graduate teaching assistant is uh, uh, Kendra Grisham from the history department. And uh, she was very um, sure that we needed to begin the semester um, with um, an exercise, but a, a meaningful one um, that asked each of the students to, um, in long form, um, share um, their goals for the semester, um, but also to think out loud about um, the communities to whom they understood themselves to be accountable um, as we did this work. Um, Kendra just reminded me as we come to the end of the semester, it's time to revisit that exercise and for us all to discover not only um, how we've measured up to what we thought at the beginning of the term, but more how we've changed across the term. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the, um, one of the discoveries um, for me um, is how far we can travel in 12, 13, 14 weeks um, as thinkers. Now, it's important to say we are aided along the way um, by um, our guests, um, right? Who come in to talk to us, yes, about their methods and about their interpretation, but also about their own challenges with mm -hmm. difficult material, um, with, um, murky matters of interpretation and more. Um, and so we, we lean importantly on a community of scholars and are especially indebted to those who um, take time. Um, I'll put a plug in that on Monday at noon, uh, Dr. Mia Bay um, will be with us to talk about her new book, Traveling Black, to help us think um, more um, expansively about the histories of segregation as we heard Dr. Green and Dr. Sanford invoke today to think about how the hospital fits in more, um, more uh, specifically into the history of the rise of segregation in Baltimore. Um, so join us at noon on Monday if, you, if you're available. Um, but those folks have been incredibly um, generous. Now, the other thing is that we do a lot of reading and um, there's a wonderful volume um, of essays um, collected under the auspices of the university studying slavery um, edited by Dr. Leslie Harris, uh, Dr. Al Brophy, and I think Dr. Jim Goodman. Um, and these are um, essays that are reflections on doing this work. So we just are leaning on community, right? And sometimes community comes the form of the lab. Sometimes it comes in the form of, um, you know, bringing in guests and colleagues. And sometimes it comes in the form of, um, of reading, right? And, mm -hmm. and benefiting from those things. And that is built in to the work we do in the lab. And I hope at least helps us in the moments where we don't agree, um, where we see material and questions differently. Um, we have touchstones right, that help us to work through those moments. Okay. We just um, got a really great question from an audience member about the future of the, of the Hard Histories projects and asking specifically, do you see memorialization of enslaved individuals, for example, as being part of a, a possible, a vision for the possible future of the work or another possibility, not mutually exclusive, but another possibility like art projects, exhibitions to honor black Baltimoreans, especially those who have been harmed by Baltimore. Yeah. I mean, sorry, by Hopkins. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, my first answer is that, you know, for me, writing the history, producing the history is a kind of memorial, is a kind mm -hmm. of reparation. It's, it's not, everything, but it is that, right? Restoring um, lives, restoring experiences, restoring communities, um, all of that is one facet of, for me, of the um, broader project of reparations. Um, it's not everything and it's not enough, but it is, I think, one essential component. So I think we do that. And um, 
from my view, um, this is work that is about a kind of justice. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and that um, is, I think, ultimately essential then to the work, for example, I know you know that at Johns Hopkins, there has been a committee um, that produced um, new guidelines for mm -hmm. naming and renaming at the university. Um, well, I hope that the work we've done at Hard Histories, um, for example, informs differently what it means when we say name something for Dr. Kelly Miller. Um, we understand better what it is that we are invoking um, mm -hmm. and what it is that we are honoring. Um, and it is more than two very slim lines right, in, a, in a website or a brochure. Um, mm -hmm. It is a life. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing that we can bring to those other kinds of projects. Um, you know, I, I also um, want to um, say that for me, it's important that, um, that in a sense, we work in our lane in the lab, um, mm -hmm. that, um, that we offer up the work um, to be used by many folks in many ways. We will um, publish student research on our webpage. Um, we aim to produce a series of film shorts um, that documentary film shorts that will um, more in a perhaps a more accessible or more engaging way um, uh, make our work available broadly and help it to circulate more widely. Um, but I hope that what we're also doing is providing to anyone um, who is looking to, um, to challenge, to rethink, um, to force a reckoning, um, or otherwise um, look for um, redress and reparation. I hope that our work is a foundation for that. It is intended to be that, um, but it is, it is not everything. And it's important to say that we, we depend on community, you know, Dr. Connolly's inheritance, Baltimore, and, mm -hmm. and, and so much more um, for the fullness of work. That the idea of the short documentary sounds fantastic. Is that a project that you envision um, the students, the undergraduates themselves, participating in the creation of as as presenters, as writers, as researchers, as filmmakers? For example, we have a great film and media studies program. We do, um, and even graduate students in film and media right. studies. Um, and so that is the vision um, that. Um, uh, we will support student filmmakers, you know, um, and our students to become producers in this more creative sense mm -hmm. of knowledge. Um, and this is another facet uh, uh, of the lab is that this is not work, in my view, that should be um, farmed out or um, left to management consultants or, um, you know, media consultants um, mm -hmm. that each time um, we uh, embark on a facet of the lab, whether it's, you know, we're in the process of, you know, putting together the physical space of the lab. Um, well, we wanna bring in the folks who are doing the, you know, the wiring of the computers um, and the hanging of the whiteboards, um, you know, the, the extraordinary staff at the Agora Institute who have, just supported us um, in every way imaginable as we've been getting off the ground. Um, my view is that we all need to be a part of hard histories in our own way and um, fully in the sense that we share um, a sense and an understanding um, and perhaps some sense of a commitment to the work um, of the lab. So students are important to that, but staff are important to that. Um, and, and anybody knows, you know, come on over to 303 um, Wyman Park building and um, stop in the lab to drop off a package and I will tell you what we're doing and why I think it matters. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hope that um, over time we're building an ethic um, that I think as Dr. Connolly alluded to, or not, he spoke to really, um, that this is, a, this is a concern, these are questions, 
um, that yes, require a certain kind of expertise or method um, experience, um, but really are um, shared by all of us. Um, mm -hmm. And so I continue to welcome folks, um, you know, in all facets of the university to stop in, to be a little part of what we do, to tell us um, how you see it. I've had extraordinary opportunities um, to visit with staffs, with faculties, with students, with organizations and associations across all of Johns Hopkins. And, and that's something that we're really honored to do, um, to be a part of the conversations you all are having um, in your spaces too. It's really powerful to think about, to think about knowledge creation in tandem with our, our self-actualization, I guess, as ethical beings. Right, that those that those intellectual journeys, intellectual, emotional, and psychological journeys are 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 entangled with each other. Yeah, and well, I mean, part of what we're doing, I think, I hope, right, if we're doing it well, mm -hmm. what we're doing is building an institutional capacity that means, in a sense, this work will never end. Right, because there will always be hard questions. There will always be hard facets. Um, I have been watching the important activism among the queer and trans community on our mm -hmm. campus this semester. Yeah. And there is hard history, right, to be better understood, to be unearthed, to be held up to the light um, on behalf of that that those communities, right. And so, what I hope we're doing is building our that muscle, that capacity to do mm -hmm. that work, um, to know how to do it when it is called for. And it will, yes, there is so much more to do in our particular project around racism and discrimination. Um, but I hope it's a model um, that we will learn to work um, in many facets of our past and our present and our future. Um, and that we, we needn't be afraid of it, Right, that we, in fact, what we learn is that we have, and that I'm a newcomer here. So I confess, I started this work and I wasn't sure if this university sort of had the, had the capacity. I just didn't know enough about us. Um, and what I have learned, right, is about the depth of capacity. Um, and, um, and I think we are building that um, together. And that's part of, for me, what a day like today is about, right? It, mm -hmm. it is, is really building that capacity and, you know, introducing more folks to some of the extraordinary intellectual and institutional leaders who they've met today, who are really responsible for um, uh, encouraging us and supporting mm -hmm. us as we expand ourselves. I, I think you're so right. That's a really beautiful um, way of wrapping up our conversation with each other. And actually, I have one last question that I know that you have addressed part of, but I want to give you the opportunity to expand on a little bit, which is, what is the best way for us to follow the work of the Hard Histories Lab? Oh, gosh. Well, people know I say join us. Um, have lunch with us from time to time when we have our public events. Um, send your students our way um, when they've got questions, um, we can give them an opportunity um, to answer them. Um, and um, to, I think, um, I guess what I wanna say is I think that um, the best thing folks can do, right, is ask the hard questions um, that they need to ask in their own place, you know, um, that we are, our work is selective, it's partial, it has to be, um, but there are so many questions to be asked. And I hope that the work we do and what we embody um, empowers folks, right, to do their own version of this work, to ask their own questions, to answer those, their own questions um, within their own department um, or school. Um, or student organization, um, or staff association, mm -hmm. um, and more. Um, I really hope that we um, we encourage folks to do that for themselves too. On the most nuts and bolts level, you mentioned you have a website, 
And does Hard Histories have social media that could be followed to find out what, you know yeah, when you guys uh, are putting on events? Yeah, we have a we have an Instagram page, and you can follow the SNF Agora Institute, which is our home and our um, our greatest supporter. Um, but we have a web page, um, Hard History dot jhu dot edu something along those lines um but um you'll be able to find all of our events um soon our student work will begin to go up on that site um and more and we really look forward to seeing folks at, at, our, at our next uh at our next couple of events coming up and later in december well thank you so much dr jones for joining us today and for presenting such a wonderful conversation was really, it was so illuminating and so wonderful to hear about the complex and sophisticated work that you're doing with the undergraduates and, and kind of helping them develop as, as researchers, as thinkers, as community members, as citizens. Okay, so thank you. And, and as, um, we're, we're wrapping up at the end of this wonderful afternoon. I have just a few concluding remarks to make, and then I will, we will set you free to continue talking and thinking and going to the Hard Histories website and seeing what event you can, you can join in yourself next to participate in these wonderful conversations that Dr. Jones and her students are, are working on and through. So, I just want to start by by thanking everyone in the audience for attending today. You know, I think clearly the topics that we've been discussing are attract a lot of attention from multiple arenas. So not just within Hopkins, but without Hopkins, and not just from within Baltimore, but from all over the country. As Dr. Jones and Dr. Rothman has said, you know these consortia of universities grappling with similar issues. But I think also undergraduates everywhere, learners everywhere are, are thinking about the ways in which racism and its legacy infused, have infused so much about our world, our society, our lives, as well as the institutions that we, that we inhabit. And we've heard this afternoon about the complexities of archival research into the relationship between slavery and institutions of higher education specifically, and in the history of it, slavery and African diasporic communities more broadly, and the ways that the, so the challenges and opportunities we find in the, in the methodology, methodological approaches to such studies, the future pathways that they that they have the potential of taking and the, the incredible diversity and, and dynamism of those possibility, those possible pathways. And the, the it, you know, returning to the, the very last it, interaction that Dr. And Jones, Dr. Jones and I had, the ways in which these kinds of conversations can help us become, all of us become more complex in our own thinking, better equipped as we continue this work to broaden the work that we're doing and to turn it into creating a, you know, a better, stronger, more just university and a more just world. So the, the rich tapestry of research that we've touched on from so many perspectives covers a lot of vital ground and throws open many doors to inquiry, future inquiry and impact. And, and of course, none of these things that we've talked about are the last word on complex histories. As Dr. Jones was saying, there will never, that we will always, there will always be hard histories. There will always be hard questions that we as a, as, as a society, as a nation, as communities are, are going to need to grapple with. And so everyone doing this research today is laying the groundwork for the research yet to come. And we can see the, the ways that scholars are laying the groundwork with Dr. Jones and, and Dr. Johnson and Turner and all of everyone, all the scholars that we've heard from today, the ways that they are laying the groundwork for their own research, for research of other scholars, and also for in, in their in our classrooms, right? With our with our students, laying the groundwork of how to 
create new knowledge in and affect the way that we that we teach our students and what we teach them, the kinds of questions that we ask ask of them and to them. So, and then of course, we've also talked a lot about everything the archives have to teach us um, in, in their presence, in their absence. And asking those, you know, sitting as Dr. Jones and I were talking about, sitting with absence in the same way that we sit with sit with presence. And how that leads us to ask new questions in in and explore in different directions in new ways so as we you know the more we learn the more knowledge that we gain the more the more we the, the more we develop answers or new ways of looking at and thinking about our own histories that these can be revelatory Right, but they can also be more complex. So in some ways, the more we learn, the less we know. And so we, you know, it continues the cycle of the need to to dig deeper and to think in more creative ways and to question ourselves and our approaches and to find new, you know, not be not ever be afraid to kind of jump into those those silences or sit with the things that make us feel uncomfortable. Um, so together, this community of scholars that we've heard from today are forging new ways to examine the past and, and, uh, and help us make sense of our present and follow those findings wherever they lead us. And of course, at the, at the heart of that in some ways, or at least it, the heart of the way that I see it is, is in the, the, the nature of the archive, because in some ways that's where, that's where when we think about knowledge production, that's where that's where we turn, right? But then, you know, thinking back to our first panel, you know, what what is an archive? Who gets to determine that? And, you know, if we think about tra a traditional archive versus a less traditional archive, who decides what those categories mean? Who decides who gets access to them? Those are very specific questions about, about archives, but they also speak to these larger questions about, about history as a discipline itself and about our about public history and you know again these important questions that were raised by in the first panel and Dr. Turner was talking about you know marginalized voices who if we talk about who what constitutes an archive and who gets to determine that we also need to talk about explicitly talk about who gets to tell which stories right which stories are being told and by whom by who are we allowing to tell those stories? Who is at the table and who is being excluded from the table? And that it is imperative for us as, as members of an institution to be very aware of the need to reconfigure um, the, the, the way that our departments, our conversations, our questions, our archives are constructed to make sure that the, that the the right voices are are at that table, and that the marge the voices that have been marginalized in the past are centered in the same way that historical subjects that have been marginalized in the past need to be centered. And so, the kind of research that we've been talking about today is of the utmost importance for universities, for for universities to do, but also for other reasons. It, taking those on and facing them, we not only approach a more truthful understanding of our own history as an institution, but become a more fully formed model for students who are learning how to seek answers to complicated questions in every field. In that, you know, as Dr. Jones and I were saying at the end, that need to, uh, us as educators, to walk our students through the process of grappling with complicated historical questions and processes and nuance, right? And, and um, what happens when things turn out to be very different than the way that you thought that they might be. And that's really challenging for, for all of us to have those experiences and our jobs as educators to help kind of lead our students through those, those types of, of, of questions. So we're showing our students how to be the best possible scholars, right? And at the center of that 
is is that uh, ourselves as ethical beings, as doing our work with integrity and purpose and thinking as Dr. Jones's graduate student was asking their, their students to think about who, what communities and who are you, what audiences, who are you accountable to in your work? We as, as educators, as members of this institution, as undergraduates and faculty, you know, accountable to. So by, before closing, um, I wanna offer a special thanks to uh, the sponsors of today's events, the Hopkins Retrospective Effort and the Krieger, Dean's, the Krieger School's Dean's Office. And I'd also like to thank the Sheridan Libraries here at Hopkins, our Central Communications Office, Open Range Video, Greenlee Graphics, and of course, all of our speakers and moderators. Thank you very much for everything that you have brought to us today to to think about and have a wonderful afternoon.